And welcome to another episode of The Glittering Bell Jar. This is episode five of season two, and this season we are reading Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince backward. My name is Valerie, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Bree. How are you, Bree? Hi, Valerie. I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. It's a lovely day here. Uh, just been busy at work, and then we do our evening recordings, and it is such a nice way to end the day. I get to do a little reading, and then I have dinner, and then we get to sit down and talk about things. And we always cover topics I never imagine, and I walk away thinking so much more about Harry Potter. I'm like, wow, I think of all the other things I could have said. Like, we had, I just have to tell a really short story. Like, a couple episodes ago, we were talking about um, the composition of Voldemort and Snape and Harry's families, where, like, for Voldemort and Snape, their fathers were muggles and their mothers were witches. And then for Harry, his father was a wizard and his mother was a muggle. And I was like, I wonder how different, I said something, but we didn't really get into it. Like, does it matter if it's your mother or your father that's the magical one? Like there are obviously gender dynamics in every relationship and every hetero relationship. And maybe it does matter that if the woman has this extra power, it creates this strange dynamic because in the case of both Voldemort and Snape, they're like their parentage and their involvement of their parents was very different than if, than in the case of Harry, right? So for Voldemort, sorry, this is a really quick, not quick tangent. For I'm Voldemort, older. right? If his father had been a wizard, would he have abandoned his child? Probably not, mm-hmm. right? He wouldn't have given up his life for his love or whatever. And same with Snape. Like if his father had been a wizard, would he have been so cold and neglectful and distant as his parents actually turned out to be because his mother was the witch. I don't know. It's just something I was thinking about when I was listening because I do go back and listen and we do our our own editing and all that. And I was just like, there's all these things I think about that I never would have thought about before. That was the moral of that long story. Yes. So I love that. So what I think about immediately is that Harry was in the womb of a, you know, a muggle born and there is science to prove, you know, all the things that can affect you in the womb. And as far as their, their genes go and, you know, what you do and what you eat and the history of what they've done in their life that they're proving that does matter. So the fact that, um, Voldemort was born to a, a witch in the womb who we know was not so nice. The same with Snape. I don't know. Maybe that affects them. The fact that they were, Mm -hmm. you know, pure blood witches. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just consider this an epilogue. So I think it's either episode two (laughs) or episode three, where we were talking about it. And I, I'm just like, I would never have wondered about the differences in parentage of when a, when a half blood has a muggle father or a muggle mother, you know, like I would never have thought about that before the podcast. And hopefully you dear listener are getting similar things out of it where you're hearing us talk about things you've never thought about before. And if you're not getting anything out of it, thank you for still listening, I guess. Thanks. (laughs) So I just had an idea. What if, if you have something, a theory, something that you've gotten from this that either we've covered and you have a counter argument, um, we want to hear it. I would love it if you just do a little, you can do a little auto recording on your iPhone and send it in. And if you, yeah, if we like it, I mean, you know, even if we don't like it, maybe we'll just, we'll have to play a couple of them on some of the other episodes to see if we like any of your theories. Mm-hmm. Or at least shout you out because editing is really hard. Just for the record, that's fair. <laughs> maybe we'll just maybe <laughs> adding just adding us. an extra audio file sounds complicated, but yeah, we will definitely. If you send us your hot take on something that we've discussed, we would love to share it and discuss it in the future, or do a bonus episode if we get enough of them. We are happy to talk Harry Potter, and we, as we showed last season, we have a guest on from time to time. So if you have a really good hot take, we might select you to join us for a future episode. Mm-hmm. Very exciting. Okay. Yep. Well, let's get into it. As a reminder, if you are listening for the very first time, you need to go back and start at episode one because we are reading Half Blood Prince backwards and we are moving very rapidly through the book. We are currently going to cover chapter 26, which is The Cave, and Brie is going to give us our summary. Chapter 26 The Cave. Professor Dumbledore and Harry arrive at a dark cliff on the sea and venture into a cave on a journey to find one of Voldemort's horcruxes. Inside the cave, they cross a lake cramped on a tiny boat filled with dead bodies floating on the surface. In the middle of the lake is a basin filled with a lake with a liquid. Dumbledore realizes he must drink the potion to obtain the locket, locket at the bottom. While drinking the potion, he screams for mercy as Harry forces him to continue to drink, having hallucinations 
and living in a reality which no one else can see. Once the liquid was completely gone, he begged Harry for water, which he then retrieves from the lake. This causes the dead bodies to become alive, and they clamor upon Harry, dragging him into the lake. Dumbledore conjures fire, which immediately scares them away from Harry, with just enough time to get across the lake and back outside the cave. Good one. And the last sentence of this chapter reads, I am not worried, Harry, said Dumbledore, his voice a little stronger despite the freezing water. I am with you. Uh, Which answers a question that that we had last chapter, last episode, which was how did Harry get a stitch in his side? And the answer is they are swimming. They do go back in the water and they swim out of the cave and then they apparate. Mm, Yes, yes, yes. Very true. Um, Love that. But that was sad. That broke my heart. Like it was very sweet. And I'm very curious how you felt about that, Um, about that sentence, about why he said it and what it meant to Harry and to him. Yeah, see, I feel it's very hopeful. I think it's the first hopeful end of a chapter we've had in this book. And we're already, you know, five or six episodes in. Um, it goes to show the confidence that Dumbledore has in Harry, that he trusts him more than he than Harry trusts himself. And this chapter in particular, Harry feels very out of his depth, very much like there's all this magic I don't know and I, I don't understand anything. And Dumbledore then says, when it matters, when it comes to keeping people safe, when it comes to defending them, I trust you. That's the kind of wizard that you're best at being. And I have no concern that you're not going to get us home safely. Mm, Yeah. I actually like that a lot. It does kind of bring us full circle with um, our previous episode. You know, I almost feel like there's that. And there's also just this, whether it's grandfatherly or mentory or whatever. um, In this chapter, we kind of see Harry being a student, very much a student and, um, kind of asking a lot of questions and being, in my opinion, a little annoying. And I feel like at the end, Dumbledore was also just doing like being just like a grandfather. Like, of course I'm fine. Like I'm with you, you know, and maybe, maybe what you said is true as well. Or just like, he did choose to say it like that though, just to um, give Harry that, that confidence and that kindness. So I, yeah, Mm -hmm. I loved that. It was very, very beautiful Mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. I actually didn't find Harry annoying in this chapter at all because I feel like there's so much in the magic that is revealed in this chapter that is beyond what we've ever seen before. I mean, there's a line in the beginning of the chapter where they're entering the cave and they're trying to find the entrance from the antechamber into the main part of the cave. And Dumbledore says, this is the place. And Harry says, how can you tell? And he says, it is known magic. And it's funny because when that when you listen to the audiobook of that, it almost reads like it is known magic, capital K known and capital M magic. Like it ha- it is known magic, but it's, it just says, he just says it with lowercase, which is, it's just, it's, there's been magic here. I can tell there's been magic here, which is never something we've ever encountered before. So for me, the questions were exactly what I have as the reader. Dumbledore's doing all this stuff we've never seen before. And Harry's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I want to know, what are you doing? So I found it as a nice, I get kind of sensitive to exposition that's like not, intelligent right like sometimes in a movie you'll be watching something and something will happen and it's obvious what it is and then a character will go what is that and you have to be like everyone knows what that is they just showed it to us we don't need you to also say it like we don't need it also said this is the kind of exposition i like where it's like i have no idea what's going on i need you to tell me and the only way to do that is through the dialogue between the two of them so i agree with you it was 100 percent necessary however i just read it and was like man dumbledore is literally like trying to like save everyone's freaking booty right now and Harry is just like so what's that like obviously we needed it but I just could only imagine as like this you know old wizard who just knows what he's doing and there's a 17 year old who has insisted he come with him thankfully or you know he wouldn't have made it back but Mm -hmm. you know he's just like good lord I'm trying to work here kid you know (laughs) yeah yeah and and I also like how though Dumbledore lets Harry try his own skills right so he lets him Mm -hmm. try and summon the horcrux he lets him like he lets him try and do some things to to learn, right? Again, we were talking last episode about how Dumbledore is being an educator. He's being a teacher. That's this book. This is Dumbledore, the teacher, teaching Harry, giving him the skills and then giving him the confidence, which we were just talking about, giving him that vote of confidence, which is actually really important because last episode we talked, they arrived back in Hogsmeade and pretty much immediately get engaged with Malfoy and Harry is stunned and unable to like he has no final words with Dumbledore that I am, I, you know, I know I'm safe with you kind of sentiment. It, it should give Harry a little bit of confidence and we know it doesn't give him, it doesn't give him as much as we wish he did, but. 
Yeah, no, I agree. And that's, I, that's why I like this book so much just because you do get some of that. You get a lot of that with Harry and Dumbledore and um, a new kind of relationship and him teaching Harry and really just preparing him. I mean, the fact that Harry wanted to go was probably just really lucky because it prepared him for all these things and realizing there's darker magic. There's things I don't understand. And now I'm going to have to go and find all these Horcruxes, you know, essentially by myself. So it, mm -hmm. it was a very important that he taught him to, like you said, kind of try his own magic. And that way he could learn that you have to think outside the box sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that he had instincts about, Voldemort and his magic and that he needs to trust his instincts which was a huge theme in Deathly Hallows because there's the scene where Dumbledore says magic leaves traces sometimes very distinctively I know Tom Riddle's style well that's critical because at a certain point in Deathly Hallows everyone's like Harry doesn't know what he's doing and Harry's like I do know Voldemort I do I've been in his mind I know the way he thinks about these things I know how he does magic I understand him and that's Dumbledore kind of saying the same thing here is Tom Riddle is a very particular human being and does things in a very particular way. And Harry needs to know that that's one, that, that Tom Riddle is distinctive and two, that he can trust himself when he encounters things he thinks are, are Voldemort because they probably are. And it's important for him to understand that. Dang. I like that a lot. I think that kind of helps me a lot because we often give Dumbledore a lot of, um, we don't like that Dumbledore uses Harry and it's kind of like, why isn't he using these other adult witches and very powerful witches and wizards? And you just summed it up perfectly. You know, everyone likes to say, well, it had to be Harry. It had to be Harry, but it never made sense to me. But it had to be Harry because he understood him, understood Voldemort like nobody else. Like you literally just said that. And that just makes, yeah. yeah he that. literally goes into his mind. Like he can see his yeah. own mind. He can like... He can be Voldemort. So he's the only one who can actually understand the way Voldemort might think about it. Probably better than Dumbledore by the end. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Mm. Yeah. That makes it a lot more clear for me. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the other thing I loved in this chapter is the little nod to Sorcerer's Stone slash Philosopher's Stone, where Dumbledore and Harry are talking about what do we do about the Inferi if they come after us while we're trying to get the Horcrux? And Harry says, they fear light and warmth so we shall call to our aid something that will if if, if will, we will call to our aid something if the need arises and harry looks confused and he says fire you know like the same thing that hermione needed to conjure to defeat the devil's snare it's like a little nod all the way back now harry forgets about fire right it's like hermione forgot she had wizarding skills ron forgets in deathly hollows and harry forgets like oh we can do a thing that like solves this problem <laughs> like we have magic <laughs> i didn't catch that i love that that's very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're really good at catching those those little nods to the past books, finding those themes. I love that. That's that's what I've always loved about the series. And so that's why I'm really enjoying this because now I'm catching new ones because I'm going the other direction as I work through the books. <laughs> you know, something that I found interesting was basically, and I do wonder if it's because Dumbledore was essentially dying and maybe he even knew at this time he might have to do something where he would die. Uh, it's actually page 566, but when they're in the boat and when they're about to be, gosh, maybe even in the cave before they get there. But I feel like Dumbledore, and maybe it's kind of when you're trying to do something important, you become very calm. But I just feel like he was very sage. I mean, they are in a boat and there are dead bodies floating below them. And he's like, just a dead body, Harry. There's nothing to fear. You know, and it's like, dude, there's dead bodies down here. Like, I'm going to fear them. <laughs> like, I just like love. He just keeps being like, no, it's fine. Like, it's just darkness. And that's what mm -hmm. you need to understand about Voldemort is that he fears things that he probably shouldn't fear. And I, um, yeah. I, it's very Dumbledore, of course, to be sage and be kind of understand things that other people don't understand. But that was a very literal example. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. dead bodies below them. And he's like, Harry, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. It, we, until we bother them, they won't bother us, which is kind <laughs> of true in most cases, in many in many parts of life, actually. <laughs> yes. Um, another thing that I caught, I have a couple things that I want yeah. to, couple, two more things that I think we should probably cover. One is the fact that Harry is such a man of his word that he obeys Dumbledore to the same extent that creature who is magically compelled to obey, obeys Regulus. Mm -hmm. which is a really interesting testament to part of Harry's character because 
All Dumbledore does is, says is, you have to give me your word. He doesn't magically compel him to keep giving him the potion. He just says, I need you to give me your word. Regulus, like, orders Creature to do the steps that result in him, like, drinking the potion and being left on the island. It's, it's it, To me, it was just a real testament. Like, it's, it's not magical, but Harry is such a man of his word that he cannot disobey when he does finally commit and say, okay, I'll do what you ask me to do. And it's as powerful. His his word is as powerful as house elf enslavement magic, basically. Mm, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. And Dumbledore knows that because, mm-hmm. you know, he insists on him giving his word. And that's, um, that's yeah, I feel like we could really dive into that. I'm not going to, but I, I love that you caught that. That is another part of his character that is, um, yeah, beautiful, actually. So. Right. It's it's just, just such a strong parallel. And and Harry isn't magically compelled to do it. And he is so good at giving the potion and convincing Dumbledore to drink the potion. Which brings me to my other point where I wanted to talk about this scene where Dumbledore is drinking the potion and he's saying all these things. So yep. what did you get in that scene? Because I got a ton and I'm curious what you got out of it. I guess the main thing I got out of it and I think in the movies it can be a little bit different the way it's seen, but the main thing is that he is not talking about the potion at all. In my opinion, he's not, he is asking his mind, whatever's happening in his own mind to stop. And that is why it is so easy for Harry, in my opinion, easier for Harry to give Dumbledore the potion because there is this part of Dumbledore's mind um, that is still, you know, call it your higher mind, right. That knows there's something else that you need to be doing. And that's why it's not like he's like, no, no, no. He's backing away from the potion. He takes it and he keeps drinking it. And I think it's because he, you know, he's what he's screaming about has nothing to do with the drink. So what do you think he's screaming about? I mean, the easy answer is the fight where, you know, which kills Ariana. And that's what Harry obviously Mm -hmm. guesses later in the book, but -hmm. he's saying them. So it makes me Mm -hmm. wonder if he's having multiple scenes happen before his eyes, or there's a scene that didn't actually happen yeah, I, I don't know. What what did you think? Because that is a it's a good question. So, yeah, I'm I was leading you and I'm glad you got the same <laughs> thing I did. The, the what Dumbledore is saying to me does not match the scene of Grindelwald, Aberforth, and Albus having a, a duel. It doesn't yeah. to me the two the language doesn't match. It's like to me, Dumbledore is being tortured by someone, which makes me wonder if there's this whole other chapter of Dumbledore's life that we don't really know. I Obviously, I don't know, but I agree oh. that the language in this chapter to me does not fit the scene with Grindelwald. And so I was curious if you caught the same thing that it's like we like we were just talking about how cohesive this character of Dumbledore is as he moves into his, we finally get his backstory in Deathly Hallows. And then I'm like, but this scene doesn't have that. It doesn't have the cohesion. The language doesn't make sense to me. It would make sense to me if what was happening is that Grindelwald had like taken Dumbledore Albus Dumbledore prisoner and was torturing his family mm-hmm. in front of him. That dynamic makes sense, but we know that's not actually the scene. And that's from the words of Aberforth and Albus themselves that they were actually dueling. So I'm not really sure what to make of this. It doesn't really feel quite as good. It doesn't fit, you know, I like it to fit and make sense, but um, I'm glad I'm not the only one that caught that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And I didn't even think about the fact that what if it wasn't about his family at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought maybe it was a different, he was just seeing something different, but with his family. Yeah. It is very possible. There was a part of Dumbledore's life that we just haven't learned about yet. So that is, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Or maybe you're right. Maybe actually in some ways it's a mix of the two. It's a mix of the scene with Grindelwald, the duel with Grindelwald and the death of Ariana and the actual act of drinking the potion that is causing him discomfort. Right. So he's saying, please make it stop. I'll never again. But it's like the, please make it stop is about, the potion and I'll mm-hmm. never again is about Grindelwald. You know, it's like two pieces and they're getting mixed together as they come out of him. Right. Yeah. I guess I saw the, well, yeah, the please make it stop is the potion, but like, I feel like he's still taking the potion in, which of course is because of Harry saying, Hey, no, take this and I'll make it stop. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Now I'm like, I, I hope maybe in future, if there are any more um, movies, <laughs> Maybe we'll get to know what that scene was if it wasn't um, his sister and brother. Yeah. 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 I don't know. 
I don't know where we'll go from here. I will say, and we haven't, we've kind of like, I still need to, I feel like we need to have just an episode talking about it, but I don't think you've seen it yet. I will say that the the new Grindelwald, Mads, Mads Mikkelsen, he is fantastic. And he and Jude Law have an incredible on-screen chemistry. Like, I wish he had been Grindelwald all along. He is wonderful. And we're probably going to get torches and pitchforks because of all the stuff going on with Johnny Depp currently in the headlines. However, there is a there is a there is a magic between the two of them on screen from the very first scene that is not present in the first two movies. And so part of me is like, this movie wasn't good. If I were the studio, I wouldn't make any more of them. But also like as a fan who saw something special happening on screen, I'm like, there's something special I want to see more of. So uh, I will I will go see them if they make more of them, but I won't have as high of hopes that the storytelling is at my exceptionally high standard that comes from the Harry Potter series. Yeah, yeah, I need to watch it so we can talk about it, but um, you have me yeah. intrigued. Yeah, Mads Mikkelsen yeah. is awesome. He's awesome. He's just just okay. a really, really, really good job. So with yeah. that... We will yep. wrap it up here. Uh, as a reminder, we love, we love, love, love your ratings and reviews. So if you are listening on your phone, please grab your phone, your muggle wand, and uh, leave us a review or leave us a rating. Uh, five stars plus whatever feedback you have. We prefer five stars. You can give us less. If you do, we will especially pay attention, but we prefer five stars. And uh, let us know what you think. You can reach us on social media, right, Bree? Yep. While you have that muggle wand handy, just... Go to Instagram, type in Bell Jar Pod, and give us a follow. Give us a like. Send me a message. I want to hear from you. Love to hear from you. It makes my day. Um, you can also find us on Twitter and TikTok. Um, yeah, reach out. Yep. And if you have something you want to share privately, if you don't feel comfortable leaving us any feedback or you just want to send us something, whatever, we also have email podcast at followthebutterflies.com. Followthebutterflies.com is a Harry Potter blog that I run. And with that, we will say this week, grab that muggle wand. It's still in your hand, right? And go to find the share button and share this with somebody who, what should, who should we share with this week? Somebody. Oh, I know. <laughs> Share with somebody who would have brought a toad to Hogwarts. <laughs> I keep bringing up Neville things, actually. It's kind of funny. But yeah, no, I think you know that person. And you don't have to tell them that that's why you sent it to them. But they brought a toad to Hogwarts. <laughs> and you love them for it. And we want to have them join and listen to the podcast. So with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you so much for listening. And we will see you next time. Yeah, see ya.